Let's go ahead and begin week four of the uh, Introduction to Paralegal Studies course. And the two skills that we're going to talk about is the two probably the most important skills that you're going to need as a paralegal. The first we've already mentioned that you're going to be doing legal research and analysis, searching for the law, for the cases that the law firm is handling. The, the second skill that probably is just as equally important is the um, interviewing of um, witnesses and doing the gathering of evidence. So that's an important part of the uh, important skill that you're going to need as well as the legal research. So that both are very important and the, um, the basis for the um, research and analysis is of course you have to find the case law and the, how are we going to do that? And the very first thing that you do in finding the case law is you have to define the issue. And this is a, a something that's going to take a while to master. What you're looking for is in any case, you're going, you're involved in a dispute. There's obviously two sides to every story. And underlying that case, there is an issue of law is there's some kind of legal issue that is the basis for the case. Now, the, the authors give you an example of how you come to, how, to, how you develop the issue. And it's kind of a simple one, but it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. And it's at the bottom of page 195. And this is what, what the tort of negligence where somebody has injured another party through their own not paying attention, causing an injury. And you notice here are the elements of the tort of negligence. The defendant had a duty of care to the plaintiff. The defendant breached that duty. The plaintiff suffered a legally recognizable injury because of the defendant's breach of the duty, and the injury was caused by the defendant's breach of the duty. So it's those elements that you're looking for if you're handling a negligence case. Now, the, that's a very simple example, but again, the, the idea is that you want to be able to have the issue formed before you do your research, because you want to have that issue so that you can then find the cases that, going, that are going to apply to the case that you're handling. Now, the, the legal research has some definitions that um, you will learn to um, find, and one of those is called cases on point. And what that means is you have found cases that are almost identical to your issue. And those are the ones you're looking for because you're trying to show the judge, look, see all these past cases were decided just like our case. So we want you to decide it in our favor so that you are looking for these cases on point. Now, they're not always obvious, and you may not find any. So it's not a, it's something that you're frustrated by. You, you may just have to get cases that are as close to the issue as you can find. Now, a further step is what we call a case on all fours. And what that means is it is identical to the case that you're working on. Very rarely are you going to find a case on all fours 
that matches your case. That would be a very rare occurrence, but it does happen. Now, these cases, as you know, are, are decided all over the United States, in all 50 states. Also, there are federal decisions. The, there is a difference between binding authority and persuasive authorities. And the difference is, binding authority is a case in your state jurisdiction. If it's a state case, the binding authorities are the cases that are decided in the state that you're doing the research. And those the judge has to follow from the implication that they're binding. Now, if you don't find a, a lot of authority in your jurisdiction, you can then search in other states and federal cases as well. And those are called persuasive authorities which means they do not have to be followed. The judge does not have to use those cases, and you're just trying to inform him or her that look at these other cases from other states. Why don't you decide our case like those, like the, the cases from the other states? Now, when we're talking about, oh, wait a minute, I think I got a problem here. Some difficulty in, let's try again. Now, we're always, we're always looking for these relevant cases. And you've learned about primary and secondary authority. And the primary authority is the actual case law are the actual decisions of the various courts. But there are tools that you use to try to find these cases. And these are and those are called the secondary authorities. And the secondary authorities are first legal encyclopedias. And there are two main legal encyclopedias that are um, available for um, legal research. Corp one has a very fancy name, Corpus Juris Secundum and American Jurisprudence. Now, Corpus Juris Secundum is volume after volume of legal cases. The, it's almost so large, it's difficult to use because there is so much information in it. So many lawyers, paralegals, use American jurisprudence because it's a little better organized than the Corpus Juris Secundum. Now, both of them are what they're described as. They're an encyclopedia, and they go from A to Z on the legal matters that are involved. And so in the legal encyclopedia, adoption would be at the front, uh, negligence would be toward the middle, and you see it's by alphabetical order as to um, how you search under the legal encyclopedias. Now there is also a um, secondary authority that you can use called case digests. And the advantage of the digests are they tend to narrow what you're looking for so that you're able to locate the, um, the cases by using the digests. They're a little more detailed so that you, um, you can use those to try to find cases. Now, I probably had mentioned before that the West company that publishes the um, case reporters has what we call a West key number system. And the authors give you an example of the key numbered system on page 202. 
And if you want to look at that, you, you see the, this is an example of negligence and you see it's broken down into each types of negligence. And so the example here is premises liability. And the premises liability would be an owner of property who could be liable for someone who comes onto their property and is injured. And you notice it's the, the little key there, that's where we get the key number system. And you notice it's broken down into various areas. So that's interesting for um, if you want to familiarize yourself with the key numbering system. The um, There are also secondary authority called American Law Reports. And the advantage of American Law Reports is in the legal encyclopedias, you know, it's just general areas of the law, negligence, all of these general areas. In American Law Reports, and it's known as ALR, as a, uh, for um, just by the letters, they take a specific case and they break down all the elements of that specific case and then they give citations for cases. So you really get an in-depth study of a particular case. So the American Law Reports is a good asset as a secondary authority because the, um, the way it's organized if your case, if you can find a similar case in the American Law Reports, you're um, you're going to be able to um, use that as a, a for um, finding the cases that you're looking for. There are treatises you don't see a lot of these. These are by legal scholars. Sometimes a law, a famous law professor will write a treatise on a certain area of the law and he will annotate it, he or she, with various cases, and so you can find case law that way. There are also what's called restatements of law, and the restatements of law are a group of law professors, prominent attorneys, judges, just legal authorities that get together and they organize a particular area of the law. So you'll find a restatements of negligence, the restatements of law of contracts, the restatement of restatements of law of probate, and here's another way that you're going to be able to find cases for a particular area. These are also helpful if you're just trying to learn something about the area of the law that you're researching, and they can give you some insights, some of the areas you want to look for when you're developing your issues. So it's important for that reason too. And finally, legal periodicals are published by most law schools and they are law articles in a, like a magazine by law students at various law schools. And of course, there are prominent law schools that you would want to look at because they would, again, describe a particular area that might be helpful for, for you. And the prominent law schools are Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of Michigan, Stanford, and a couple of others. So occasionally you can find the the law in these various um, legal periodicals. Now I mentioned that Westlaw publishes the reporters and he, the state reporters, the case reporting system, is nationwide throughout the United States. And these are all of the case decisions in the various jurisdictions, all of them. 
So you can imagine the enormous amount of work that this takes. The reporters are organized regionally. And so depending on where you are, where your state is in the United States, that is the various reporter system that you use. Now I practice law in Florida and there's a, a uh, diagram on page 210 that shows you how this is organized. And if you notice, Florida's in the Southern Reporter and cases from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana are all in the Southern Reporter. And so if you find your state you can find out what reporter system you are in. And you notice Pacific would be the states out west, and the north eastern would be, of course, in the, uh, the northeast. So you can identify where your state falls within the reporter system. And remember, these cases are only the appellate cases. Trial courts usually do not write an opinion. And so remember the structure of our court system, the District Court of Appeals and then the Supreme Court in each state, those are the opinions that you're looking at. Now there's also federal reporters. And the federal reporters again report all all of the courts including the trial courts in the federal system the district courts which are the trial courts the the district court judges write opinions so they are reported in the federal report remember the circuit court of appeals is the intermediate appellate court and again that's organized geographically throughout the United States and the any appeals from the district court go to the circuit court of appeals in the um, in the circuit that you're located now the US Supreme Court of course is the final authority for law in the United States. A case that's decided by the U.S. Supreme Court is the law of the land, we should we could say. It is, author it is, and when we're talking about mandatory authority and persuasive authority, any U.S. Supreme Court case is mandatory authority. Every judge is required to follow the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, because it's so important, the Supreme Court has three reporter systems. And the reason for that may become evident. The first reporter, the U.S. reporter, reports the entire opinion of a Supreme Court case. And as you can imagine, sometimes they're 100 pages long. So the, this is an enormous volume, and they report all of the reporter, the, the actual case opinion. Now the other two, Supreme Court Reporter and Lawyer's Edition of the Supreme Court, they go in and kind of break down and, and highlight the most important parts of the opinion. So you don't see the whole opinion, but you kind of get the meat of the opinion and so you can just you do not have to read the whole opinion that's contained in the U.S. Reporter. So that's the reason it's kind of a, a abridged version for busy lawyers that have to read so many of these cases. And um, they, um, they're only going to highlight the important parts. Now, how do we go about anal when we're analyzing the case law? The, 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 when you go to the reporter system, you are going to see the case organized in a certain way. First, it's going to have a title, and the, the authors give you an example 
over on pages 216 and 217 as to what an opinion from a court would look like. And you notice it starts with the title. That's the parties in the case. And in the example, this is the Boston Housing Authority versus Emmett Bridgewaters. That, that's what we call the, um, the title. The citation is, you see, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, and there is the citation that um, you would go to look for this case. And just to give you an example, you see the second citation, 898 Northeast 2nd, 848. And if you remember, the Northeast Reporter, Massachusetts, he would be in the Northeast Reporter. So if you go to volume 898, and many of the reporters, because there are so many cases, they've gone to a second edition. There's a first reporter, some are even on the third edition. So if you go to volume 898, Northeast 2nd, page 848, this case is going to appear there. And that would be how you find the um, case. Now, some will have a docket number. You notice they've indicated it here. That, um, that would just be an identifier for the case. Every report, every case in the reporter system contains what we call head numbers. And head notes appear at the beginning of the opinion. It's not the actual court's opinion. Westlaw hires lawyers to analyze these cases and to indicate certain areas that are important in the opinion. And that's what we're, are called head notes and they are identified in various areas. And it helps you in, your do, in doing research because by reading the head notes, you may be able to tell, well, is this case worth reading the whole opinion? And you might be able to eliminate it by reading the head notes. No, this isn't the case I want to use. You find a case that you want to use, then you're going to read the whole opinion. And that, that's the next part of the um, reporter is the actual opinion written by the judge. And you will find that at the end, it will be signed by the particular judge and, in, and indicated um, whatever the court's opinion is. And of course, in any legal matter, yeah, it's great to have an opinion on something, but courts have to decide actual disputes. And so the court has to render a conclusion as to how the case is to be decided. And that, that's the final decision that the, um, the court is going to um, come to. Now, in doing the um, analyzing of a case, there, there is a acronym that lawyers use, and you'll, you'll see this frequently. It's called IRAC, I-R-A-C. And it means for every case, there, there's a factual situation that occurred. And the facts, of the case are what go, are, we're going to look for to find out what the issue is. Because from the facts, you can formulate an issue that applies to that particular fact situation. What you're trying to do is, you're, once you've developed your issue in the case, your legal research is going to show you what are the legal rules that apply to a specific case like this. And you're going to try to find the case law 
that applies the legal rule that you're looking for. Well, the second step is you're going to apply the legal rule to the facts of your case. And finally, like any other case, it's a legal dispute. There's got to be a conclusion that the court comes to after applying the rule to the facts. And the conclusion is the court's decision, judgment for plaintiff, judgment for defendant, based on these reasons. Now we mentioned that there are other sources of law that you can research. And the first one, constitutional law, you're gonna rarely in a law firm have to do any kind of search involving constitutional law, unless you're working in a criminal defense firm or for the state attorney. Then you're going to have numerous constitutional issues and you probably know them by heart, unreasonable search and seizure, uh, taking the Fifth Amendment, you do not have to testify against your interests, the Eighth Amendment, the everyone's entitled to a fair trial. So for most civil cases, you're not going to have a constitutional issue. That would be very, very rare. And I mentioned the only time you'd be dealing with constitutional issues is of course in a criminal case or the firm that you work for does constitutional law, does civil rights law. And so you'd be dealing with the, um, those constitutional issues. Now we learned there is another area, there is another area of the law in addition to the case law and the constitutional law is the statutory law. And every state legislature, all 50 of them, pass laws in their state all the time. And they, of course, are the law of that state. And so you'll be doing searches in statutory law as well if you find an area that applies to your case. It isn't on the um, PowerPoint, but also the last area of the law, the administrative agencies. Also, you may have a case where an administrative agency is involved and you're going to do research just like you do with the um, case law. Well, let's talk about the other skill that you're gonna wanna have and that is conducting interviews and investigations. Almost every case I would think 100% of them, they're going to be individuals involved. And these individuals have knowledge of, of the facts of the case, and you're going to want to interview them. And so, like with any project, you want to plan ahead as to what you're going to ask this individual, and you want to have questions that solicit answers that you want for your client's case. So the interview process is a very people intensive process. You're going to be sitting with someone and asking them questions, sometimes very personal questions, sometimes embarrassing questions. So the planning of the interview is very important and your interviewing skills are one of the other important skills you want to develop. Along with the interviewing skills, you of course want to have some interpersonal skills because you want to make the witness or the client that you're interviewing feel comfortable. And so you want to be able to communicate with this person, make them feel comfortable, get them to answer the questions that you're looking for. And so you want to be able to have those interpersonal skills. And of course, along with the interviewing skills, you're going to have questioning skills, the kinds of questions that you want 
you are going to answer are are going to elicit the answers that are um, are going to help your case. Usually, open-ended questions are the best. And what we mean by that is a closed-ended question would be an answer that elicits a yes or no. And the um, you don't want the yes and no answers. You want the witness to elaborate on what occurred. Where were you standing when the accident occurred? What time of day was it? Was the was it in the afternoon, in the morning? Was what was the weather like? Was it raining? Was it was there a clear sky? Was it foggy? What um what did you observe? Involving the accident. Those are the open-ended questions that you want to ask. Now here there If you're going to be a good interviewer You obviously want listening skills. You're gonna to have to be a good listener Because if you're constantly talking and not listening Then what's the point of the interview because you're trying to get information from this witness and if you're talking all the time, they're not answering you. So you want to be a good listener as well. Now, there are various types of witnesses that are used in a, in a case, in a lawsuit. And you notice they're listed there. The first is an expert witness. And almost every case that you're going to be involved in is probably going to use an expert witness. And these are individuals that through training, through their education, through their experience, are experts in a certain area. And the, a simple example, I'll, I'll keep it to the car accidents because that, that would be a simple way to explain it. You might have an expert witness that testifies about car, the speed of cars, how long it takes to stop from a particular speed, and you want to have that witness, that expert witness, testifying in your case to help prove the case that you want. If you had an issue, let's say, in a, a will contest where someone is questioning the, um, the validity of a will and the mental state of the testator is always an issue. And you would get an expert witness, usually a psychiatrist, psychologist, to testify as to what the, the mental capacity was of the testator. Now, lay witnesses are everybody else. That's you and me. That's the, just the general public. Uh, we may just be standing on a corner and see something and we are the lay witnesses now if we actually have if we actually have witnessed what occurred then we're an eyewitness we're the most important kind of witness because we've actually seen what occurred in the incident and so you would be a, a very key part of a case if you actually have eyewitness testimony as to what occurred. Now, every case has two sides. The plaintiff has his or her side, the defendant has his or her side. And it's amazing when you hear both sides, how different the same incident is described as. It's almost hilarious sometimes how different the impressions are from the uh, the parties and how different they have perceived what occurred and so if you're going to be interviewing witnesses that support your client's case they of course are going to be friendly witnesses they're going to be easier to deal with because in most cases they want to help your client they may be friends or family members so, so they want to support your client and help his or her case. 
Now, the witnesses on the other side that don't agree with your client's position are hostile witnesses. And, of course, they're going to be difficult to deal with, and you've got to handle them in a certain way. Because in dealing with a hostile witness, you, you can hurt your client's case by antagonizing them or insulting them. Um, I'm not answering any more of your questions. These are stupid. In other words, you want to be, you've got to handle a hostile witness much differently from the friendly witnesses that support your, um, your client's case. The, uh, the last area that you're going to be doing, the other skill, is investigating. The, in the car accident example I gave, there's, there's going to be a, a recreation of how the accident occurred. You're going to be doing investigating. There are professionals that do this as well. And so if it's a, let's say, a business dispute over a contract, there may be computer records that you have to check. And the, there can be um, paper files that have to be investigated. So any case is going to have some form of investigation involved in it. Now, in overall, in any of this, in the interviewing and the investigation, all cases are governed by the rules of evidence. And this is an area that has been developed through the years, like the case law, as to the importance of certain facts, how certain facts are produced, the, the various ways that this information is treated. And the, the first example there is direct versus circumstantial evidence. And you may have heard this in a, if you've read about a murder trial, Direct evidence is the actual evidence that is presented. The defendant was at a particular spot. Yes, I saw him on the corner at midnight. That's direct evidence from an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is the defendant purchased a handgun a day before he shot and killed the victim. That's circumstantial because, again, it's not direct evidence that he actually killed the victim. It's just evidence that he, it's close to the time that the event occurred and he purchased a handgun. So that's what we call circumstantial evidence. Now, any evidence that's presented, and, and this, these rules are used in the actual trial, and all of these would be examples of rules that are used in an actual trial. All evidence has to be relevant. Remember, there can be a lot of information about a situation, but we're only interested in the relevant facts. So relevance is always important for any evidence that's going to be presented. Relevant, relevance means it applies to the case that we're um, involved in. Um, I'm not going through all of them that the authors give you in the book. Um, my, some evidence has to be authenticated. In other words, as I mentioned, there may be computer records and you have to show to the court that I gathered this evidence from the defendant's computer. And you have to show how you did that. And that it has any kind of evidence that's going to be presented. Many, and in many cases, a, any kind of paper evidence, computer evidence, uh, telephone calls have to be authenticated that this is how I obtained this information and it is the, the evidence that will, um, will go to the proof of the case. 
And finally, hearsay is an important rule in any kind of trial. And hearsay is very complicated. It has many exceptions. Uh, we could spend another, we could have another course on just hearsay. But generally, what hearsay is, is a witness cannot get on the stand and say, I heard that the defendant said this to so-and-so, to, to Mary. That's hearsay. The witness can't testify to what somebody else said. So that if that we're going to have testimony about a particular issue, let's call Mary and get her to tell us what the conversation was about. That hearsay is an important part of any um, trial. So I'm going to conclude the week four meeting at this point.